So um, I want to start today with a story. Oh, by the way, we finished our Gospel According to the Beatles last week, and I've just had an influx of people saying, have you thought about the Gospel According to? And so the most recent ones were Gospel According to Queen, <laughs> uh, Gospel According to Abba, um, and then here's one. Last night, I had the recommendation, the Gospel According to Ted Lasso. How about the gospel according to not a chance in the world that is ever going to happen, right? So this is quite a change that we're going to go from the Beatles to what we're going to do today. And let me set this up with a story. Charles Dodson in the 1860s was a professor of mathematics at Christ Church in Oxford, England. Brilliant mathematician. But he also had this creative side. And so Charles Dodson wrote a children's book. Um, called Alice in Wonderland. His name, his pen name was Lewis Carroll, and that's how most of us remember Charles Dotson was through that. But when Queen Victoria read Alice in Wonderland for the first time, she was enthralled. And so she wrote Lewis Carroll. She said, please send me any other books that you have written. And the only other book that he had written was a textbook called The Syllabus of Plain Algebraical Geometry, (laughs) which he sent to the queen, right? So we intuitively know that some books are so easy and accessible and they're enjoyable because of that. They're like Alice in Wonderland. They just kind of pull us into another world. And we know intuitively that there are some books that are just a lot more difficult. And so that's kind of between the Beatles and what we're doing now is going to be quite a bit of a change because the Beatles is enjoyable, it's easy to absorb, and it's, it's engaging. Now we're going to do something that's a little bit more like algebra than it is Alice in Wonderland. And we're going to go to the book of Hebrews. And so this is a good hint that you might want to turn there to Hebrews right now while I'm, while I'm rambling on up here for a few moments. But the book of Hebrews is not the easiest book in the Bible. Now, it's not the hardest book, okay? That's probably reserved for one of the minor prophets or, or the book of Revelation. But there are books in the Bible that, that we find to be easy because they're engaging. Probably the book of Psalms for you because it's so emotional. It's pouring everything out to God. The book of Proverbs, we need a lot of wisdom in our world and those little nuggets of distilled wisdom all over the book of Proverbs. Book of John is a favorite for a lot of people. It talks about Jesus in very open, interesting language. But the book of Hebrews is just a little bit more of a challenge. And so, I don't know about you, but occasionally I like things that are easy, but occasionally I also like things that are a bit of a challenge because when I have to challenge myself, the reward is typically greater. So we're going to spend all summer long in the book of Hebrews, taking it a step at a time. It's going to be challenging at some points, but I think the reward is great. But there is a big reason that I'm having us hit Hebrews hard this summer, and you'll see that in the introduction that I'm about to give. So we don't know exactly who wrote the book of Hebrews. The Catholic Church unquestionably says it's Paul the Apostle, but it's just not Paul's style. It's just not, it's some of his content, but the style is so different. I just can't see it being as Paul. Now, I do believe that whoever wrote Hebrews, and only God knows, that he ran in the same circles as Paul because it mentions Timothy, who is, of course, Paul's protege. So kind of in the same circle, but probably not Paul. God knows. But we do have a better idea about when the book of Hebrews was written. Because the writer of Hebrews mentions the temple in Jerusalem where sacrifices were still taking place. And we know from history that the general, the Roman general Titus marched in Jerusalem in 70 AD and raised the temple. It was destroyed in 70 AD. So if Jesus was resurrected in 29 AD, and the temple was destroyed in 70, and the writer of Hebrews leads us to believe that those sacrifices are still happening. Somewhere in that first 40-year swath of Christian history is when the book of Hebrews was written. But now here's why it was written and why it's important for us. Even though Christianity was still very young, there were people already bailing on the faith. They, they were Jews by background, and maybe they missed the familiar aspects of their religion, so they were walking away from their faith in Christ to go back to an old religious system. In a way, they were deconverting. In a way, they were drifting away from the faith. They were disowning their faith. They were destroying their faith. 
And in this day and time, the word we use for that is called deconstruction. Listen, there's nothing new under the sun, but maybe you've seen it as I have, and I don't know if you have or not. This has always been happening, but our publicity and social media is just so much more there, right? And we hear people all the time that are deconstructing their faith and really deconverting, moving away completely from Christ. I'll put a footnote here. Tim Keller, God bless his memory, has written a wonderful article on this, wrote a wonderful article. You can just Google Tim Keller deconstruction, and it explains this entire process and this entire phenomenon that we are seeing, which is really nothing new, of people who once called themselves Christians who say, I no longer think I need or want to follow Christ. That's where the book of Hebrews is going to come in as important to us. What does this writer have to say? And, and by the way, let me say a personal word to you. If you are kind of going down that road of beginning to deconstruct and destroy your faith, think very carefully about what you're doing. Pray very intently about what you're doing. Because not only is it affecting you, it's going to affect future generations of your children and your grandchildren. Think very clearly about this. And that's what the writer of Hebrews invites us to do. So here's how Hebrews opens. And by the way, Hebrews is a little clunky as you get into it because there's a lot of quotations from the Older Testament. In fact, I don't think there's any New Testament book that teaches us more how to handle the Older Testament than the book of Hebrews. But even though it's a little clunky at some parts, man, the opening is beautiful and brilliant. Here's the opening words. In the past... God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he assigned as heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. There's a lot packed there in just those two opening verses. So the writer talks about the past and the last. Okay, So in the past, what we know about God from all the Older Testament is that God is a self-revealing God. God is a God who speaks. God is a God who wants to be known and known personally by us. So the way God speaks is very different for many of us. Now, um, by the way, I, I find it interesting. You know the Ten Commandments. Please tell me you know the Ten Commandments. You know, at least you know about them hypothetically, right? So ten times God says, here's right and wrong. Now, you can try to negotiate that if you want to, but I've made the universe, and so I kind of know the way it works best. Here's, here's right and wrong. These are pretty non-negotiable, right? But do you also know that when God created everything, in Genesis 1, you know how many times it says, and God said? Ten times. So in creation and commandments, and, and ten is a number in the Bible that's connected with completeness. You know, babies born with ten fingers, ten toes. There's a sense of completeness. God wants to be known as fully as we can possibly understand him. But not only in general, but specifically, God related to different people at different times and in different ways. The best contrast for me is Moses and Elijah. They both were at Mount Sinai at some point in their lives, several hundred years apart. God shouted to Moses through the commandments. God whispered to Elijah in his distress. Sometimes God shouts. Sometimes he whispers. And I think all of us have an opportunity to learn, how do I best hear God? Now, there are some ways that I think are standard for all of us through the Scripture and through prayer and through Scripture memory and through fasting and through meditation. But it really is up to you to experiment and to play with this idea of how can I hear God knowing that he wants to be heard. It's not that God's not willing to speak, is we're just often too busy to hear. So in the past, here's what God did. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Listen, here's the one refrain I'm going to hit today over and over and over again. Jesus tells us everything that is knowable about God. And I need to, to phrase that. Not everything that's knowable in the eternal sense, but everything that we're capable of understanding 
We're, we're the ones limited here. Jesus has taught us everything within our capability that's knowable about God. So my wife and I have told you before, my wife and I have breakfast every Friday morning. It's our date morning. We go to a little restaurant in South Tulsa. And I've joked with you before. Actually, I've offended a person or two. And I said, uh, hey, if you see us on Friday morning, you see us at our breakfast table, come by and say hi, but then leave. <laughs> I'm kind of joking, but I'm kind of not because is, does that sound rude to you? Okay, well, don't let the door hit you on the way out then, you know. No, but, but, but what it is, is um, during the week, I'm pulled in so many different directions, and so is my wife. This is our time to focus on one another. And so we, we sit and talk, and there's uh, several times on Friday morning where I go, honey, I've just used all my words. Men, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Especially as an introvert, I just go, I, you know, it's Friday morning. I know it's our date morning, but I'm out of words. But I'll say to my wife, I may not say a whole lot, but I'm listening to every word you say. My eyes may be closed, I may be doing this, but I'm listening to every word that you say. No. And, and oddly, as soon as I say that, it kind of frees me up a little bit, and then I, I do want to talk, but I know, and she knows, I'm listening. As followers of Jesus, we should listen to every word he has to say. Everything he ever did, we ought to think about it, meditate on it, consume it, integrate it, bring it into our lives. In the past, God spoke in many times and in various ways, but at last, he has spoken to us clearly. There's nothing more that heaven can now give. So, the writer of Hebrews doesn't leave this kind of as, a, as this nebulous idea. He develops it and said, if you want to listen to Jesus, here's, here's what you're going to hear. Um, let me stop here and just give a story about John Cage. John Cage was an experimental composer in the 60s, 70s, 80s. I think it was 85, he wrote a piano piece, and here's the title, and here's the musical instruction. It was called, As Slow As Possible. In other words, when you play this thing on the piano, you just play it as slow as possible. So the actual rendition could be anywhere from 17 to 90 minutes. But then somebody had a brilliant idea, and John Cage rewrote this for the organ. Okay? And there's an organ that is sitting there today in Haberstadt, Germany, that's playing this song right now as we sit here. Okay? It's being played as slow as possible. This entire piece written by John Cage is set to be performed, here's the total performance length, 639 years, okay? Just slightly longer than this sermon this morning, some of you are thinking, right? 639 years. So it started September 5th, 2001. The first part of the composition is a rest, so actually nothing happened. This is a specially constructed organ using sandbags to depress the pedals. The first note was sounded February 5th, 2002. And this entire composition Every couple of years, the note is changed. Do you get the idea? As slow as possible, 639 years. The next time the note is set to change is in February of next year. And what will happen on that day is people will come from all over the world to listen to that note change. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 hits seven notes. And by the way, I think it's interesting that there are seven notes on a major musical scale. But these notes are being played over and over and over again. Who Jesus is, how he has revealed God, how he has shown us everything that is knowable about God, these notes have been played for the last 2,000 years. And until he returns, this is who Jesus was and is and is to come. This is who he is. So let's listen to this composition as Jesus reveals to us everything that is knowable about God. I'm just going to walk through these one at a time. The sun is the exact radiance of God's glory. So, if it ever comes time for Tulsa to be in the path of a solar eclipse, you know this, you don't look straight up at the eclipse. It will blind you. If you try to look directly into the glory of God, you will not be able to take it. Okay, if we can't Take the physical sun, imagine the eternal God. Here's the best way to watch an eclipse. You don't need any special tools. A friend of mine taught me this last time. 
just make a circle with your hand and hold it like this and let the sun go through your hand to the pavement below and you'll see what's happening right there on the pavement. In other words, you can take what's happening with an eclipse and condense it to where you can watch it in a manageable format. If you want to know who God is, look at the hand. Not your hand. The hand of Jesus Christ. Pierced on your behalf. This is the identity and the love of God. But he puts it in a way, again, Jesus tells us everything that is knowable about God. Not everything that can be known about God, but everything that we can handle. So Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Now, that word, representation, is a familiar word in the Greek. It's the word character. It's the idea of almost like a wax seal, a stamp that bears the exact likeness. Again, Jesus tells us everything that is knowable about God. So many times the reason people get disillusioned with God and deconstruct their faith and drift away from the faith is that they're looking at the wrong things. Listen, if you want to know who God is, don't look at people in the church. If you want to know who God is, don't look to the pastor. Now, should I model what it means to be a follower of Jesus? Yes, but if you're looking at me to understand who God is, you are looking in the wrong place. Don't you dare say amen right now. I know you want to. Yeah. Or if you're looking at your parents, well, if that's the way Christians are, and I don't want to be like my parents. If you're looking at anywhere else, you will be disappointed. If you're looking for the character, the impression, the imprint of God, there's only one person to look to. He is the fullness of God's glory, the exact representation of his character. I don't mean this to sound rude, but if you're looking at other places to see who God is, don't be surprised that you're disappointed. We're made to look in one place. So he's the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. He sustains all things by his powerful word. Paul says this in the book of Acts. He says, in him we live and move and have our being. The one who holds all of creation together is Jesus Christ. In fact, if he were to remove himself from the created order, we would cave in on ourselves. We would cease to exist because he is not here to sustain it. So a little over a month ago, I had surgery. How many of you have ever been under general anesthesia before? Let me see your hands. How many of you really enjoyed being under general anesthesia. Yeah, it's some of the best sleep I've ever gotten. It just happens so quickly, right? My mind is always going. Uh, so I'm glad I don't have access to that stuff, right? So I was just being put under for this surgery, and a friend of mine who's a doctor at that same hospital came by just to see me and say hi to me. And after the surgery, he called me and said, hey, I, I came by to see you as they were knocking you, knocking you out. And I go, I have no memory of that whatsoever. He said, I'm not surprised. Well, then a couple days later, I'm trying to go to sleep at night, and all of a sudden, like a flash, it comes back to me. I see my doctor friend standing over me. He's patting my hand saying, you're going to do a great job. It came back. I remembered it, and I called him just so I wouldn't think I was imagining. I said, did you do this? He goes, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what happened. But here's the deal. Whether I had ever remembered it or not, he was still there. He was still in the room. Listen, whether you know it or not, whether it registers with you or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, Jesus Christ has been with you every moment of your life. And here's the deal. Most of us, it's not that, that Christ is absent. It's that we're just not aware. But when that moment comes that you're aware, but even if you're not, it doesn't change the reality he is there, and he has sustained you every step along the way. So, the sun is the radiance, the exact representation, sustaining all things that includes you. After he provided purification for sins, that's the fourth note. And I'm going to take the fourth and the fifth note together. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God in heaven. So this is the first overture we get in this fourth and fifth note about Jesus being our priest before God. And, and by the way, in the we'll, book of Hebrews, we'll develop this more as we go through. 
But the idea of priesthood is in the Older Testament, again, the temple was still standing, the priest would make the offering before God, and then when done, would sit down. So what does this tell us? This tells us that Jesus has done everything that needs to be done to restore our broken relationship with God. It's all that needs to happen. So if you're here today and you're still trying to get to heaven, if you're still trying to make up for something you've done, if you're still trying to make your relationship with God right, you can try for all eternity. It's never going to be enough. And by the way, it's already been done for you. And some people frown on Christianity for this very reason, to say, well, I don't have to try to do good things. I just trust Christ. But I think we know each other well enough to know that's the hardest thing for us to do. We all like to be in control. We all like to do something. But instead, this is a letting go and letting Christ be sufficient. In that regard, can I ask you this? Have you ever really trusted Christ? I hope you have. But if you're still trying, there's good reason to give a pause and think. And then these last two notes. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he inherited is superior to theirs. Who he is and the name that he has surpasses any other being in existence. Brought a deck of cards this morning. We're going to have a little poker tournament after church. I just think that some of my Baptist forebearers, you know, Baptists back in the day were really against dancing and card playing and all of that. You know, some of them are rolling over in their grave right now. Okay, what has this world come to? Wild Bill Hickok, 1876, was in a bar and he had a saloon and he had played cards all night long. And one of his competitors, who was a stranger, he had taken all his money. He, that competitor lost every bit. And Wild Bill Hickok was a lawman. He was an entertainer. He was a gambler. He was a sharpshooter, all these things. Well, he took all this man's money, felt bad, so he bought him breakfast. <laughs> That's a nice gesture, right? But after this man left the saloon, he realized he'd lost all his money, and he felt insulted that this man had to buy him breakfast with his own money. So he walked in the saloon, and he went up to the back of Wild Bill Hickok and shot him at point-blank range, killing him instantly. Somebody had the thought, well, that's a real pick-me-up story, isn't it? Somebody had the thought to look at the hand that Wild Bill Hickok was holding. And it just so happens he was holding two aces and two eights. Does anybody know what this is called? Dead man's hand, right? A dead man's hand. And poker players today, so I'm told, not that I would know this, but poker players, if they draw two black aces and two black eights, they fold out of reverence, out of respect for Wild Bill Hickok. They fold the dead man's hand, right? The way that most of the world has looked at Jesus is he just drew a bad hand. Romans and the Jews decided he needed to be eliminated and he's died. Turn the page. Let's go to the next part of history. But for those of us who are his followers, we know there's more. In fact, the hand that he was dealt went from death to life on our behalf. And here's the deal. Jesus Christ tells us everything that is knowable about God. And not only who God is, but who we can be as living in his presence. Jesus. The exact character. The magic glory. I'm having a little trouble with the microphone here. Hang on. We're going to get through this together, right? Jesus tells us everything that is knowable about God. Do you think that's ever God's way of saying it's time to end the sermon? I think so, all right? Let me give you one more thing before we go. Um, I said we're going to do the hard thing this summer, and I knew I shouldn't have played with cards this morning. That's why that happened. <laughs> Some of you are out there going, serves him right. <laughs> serves him right. Since we're doing one hard thing this summer, I want us to do two rather challenging things this summer. So as you leave today, there's going to be these prayer reminder bookmarks in the window ledges. I'm going to ask you to pick one of these up. And I'm going to ask you to pray for 13 people this summer. Now, the reason for 13 is there are 13 chapters in the book of Hebrews. Hey, 
Well, we're doing these 13 chapters. Let's pray for 13 people. And here's who and how I would invite you to pray. Now, you can tweak this for your own needs. But the first person I want you to pray for is yourself. Fill in that blank. Pray for yourself. Listen, you can pray self-focused prayers without being selfish, okay? And the way I'm asking you to pray on the back, this is section one under the, on the back, pray for yourself. Pray Hebrews 6.19. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. Especially if you're considering deconstructing your faith or drifting from your faith, we need an anchor to hold us. Pray that for yourself. Life is hard. The world is not easy. But God is good. And we need to hold on to him for everything we've got. The next six blanks, I would encourage you to pray for fellow Christians. Certainly you know six followers of Jesus who are going through a difficult time. Maybe mourning a lost loved one or going through an illness or a challenging season with a child. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 is the way I'd ask you to pray for them. Throw off everything that hinders, the sin that entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Pray for other followers of Jesus that we don't stop, that we keep going. Then the last six blanks. This is going to be a little more challenging. I want you to pray for people who do not yet know Christ. Or, and as I've begun to write names on it this week, those people who at one time would have called themselves Christians, but they no longer follow Christ, write their names in and start praying for them. I'm not saying you can't open your mouth and share the faith with them. I believe we should. But before we open our mouth to them, we ought to open our mouth and our heart to God. That's the information. Let me give you a little more inspiration about this. Again, 13 names. I'm asking you to pray for people every day this summer. Bring this with you to worship. We're going to lift these names up before the Lord all summer long. Let's see what God does. But here is the impetus behind this idea. And it comes from D.L. Moody, who was a pastor back in the 1800s. I'll just read this so I don't mess it up. Moody's entire evangelistic strategy was prayer. That's it. In an oft-told story, um, many before me have recounted that Moody famously carried a list of 100 names in his pocket every day of his adult life. 100 friends who had no relationship to Jesus. Moody's labor of love was secret and hidden prayer on their behalf. He pleaded with God to reveal himself to each of them in a way that they could perceive and receive his eternal love. He prayed for them by name and for their salvation. Now get this. When he died, 96 of the names on that list had become answered prayers. A 96% success rate in prayer is pretty good. Not bad at all. I take those odds any day of the week. But it gets better. At Moody's funeral, the four remaining names were each in attendance. Those four friends were, independently, so moved by the memorial service that they all came to faith at Moody's funeral. Okay. So if a man can pray for 100 people every day of his adult life, don't you think we, a little more ordinary pedestrian people, can pray for 13 people every day this summer, doing the hard thing, like studying Hebrews, doing the hard thing by putting ourself aside a bit and praying for others, just may so happen to be one of the most rewarding things we ever do. Let's stand together and let's pray together. So Father, I pray over the prayers in here in this room today. I pray this not be something we do just because it feels good, but that we would commit ourselves to doing some challenging things this summer, to study a part of your word that is not easily attractive or immediately attractive, and that also that we would pray and love people, ourselves, fellow followers of Jesus, and those who do not yet know you or maybe who have drifted from their faith and are lost. And so help us to do that diligent, silent work of love in your presence. And we commit this to you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So we're not going to open up the follow-up room. Not yet. We're going to sing a song of response. Again, Jesus, 
tells us and shows us everything that is about God that is knowable. Let's, let's worship him as such. And then we're going to share communion together before we leave this space. Jeff.